Welcome to this special BMJ interview with Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the United States. I doubt there will be many of you who have not heard of Dr. Fauci. He is the US government's top infectious disease expert. He has led the US National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases for nearly four decades and is at the forefront of the US response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Fauci, welcome. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start, if I may, by congratulating you on being awarded the Gustavo Lionheart Award from the National Academy of Medicine for decades of work improving public health and leadership in shaping the COVID-19 pandemic response. This is a big deal. <laughs> well, I guess so. It's, uh, it's always very humbling to get awards when you're involved in something that in that it depends on so many people working with you, but... Uh, well, the citation said um, it talked of your leadership of federal research and policy on infectious diseases over many years, and in particular, your deft, scientifically grounded leadership in shaping an effective response to the COVID pandemic. I wonder what you think about the timing. Um, is this a vote of confidence and support from your peers and colleagues? What, what does it mean to you at this time? Well, I mean, I like I said, I, I'm, I feel very humbled and privileged to be uh, given such a prestigious award from the Academy of which I've been a member for so long. Um, you know, in some respects it is um, an affirmation of science. You know, I think that right now, as you are probably aware, that there is a bit of an anti-science flavor, not only in the United States, but globally, a distrust of science, maybe as a representative of authority. Uh, and if this is an affirmation of the confidence of the peers in the scientific process, in the clarity and transparency of what we try to do in science, uh, that's very nice if that's the case. I think it is. So I feel, uh, um, you know, like I said, in many respects, very humbled by such a prestigious award. Many people will remember you for the way you pressed for revisions of drug regulatory policy to allow people who were dying from HIV AIDS to access experimental drugs. At the time, you had been attacked by patient groups, and I gather that you met them and changed your view. So you sort of had an instinctive sense, it seems to me, of what needed to be done. I wonder how the pressure you were under then from patient activists and right-wing establishment compare with the sort of pressure you're under now. You know, it, it, it's in some respects similar because it's pressure. And whenever you have pressure, you've got to make sure you act in a very measured way based on evidence and science, but at the same time, being sensitive to the needs of people, uh, particularly when you think back at the years of HIV AIDS, it was a different situation. Uh, the government at the time, our government, our federal government early on in the 80s, was really not uh, either paying attention to or being sensitive enough to the needs of people who were directly impacted by this terrible new disease of HIV AIDS. And one of the things that I think uh, was important, and if I think back of the things that I've done in my professional career, uh, it was to keep an open mind to realize that although science is built on evidence and facts, we've got to make sure when we apply science to people, to human beings. We've got to make sure that we take into account their special needs and the needs of people who are either living with HIV or were who are concerned about acquiring HIV, that the rigidity of the scientific process, which in many respects is a very good thing because there are certain things about science that need to be immutable. Uh, and then there's the regulatory process, which is definitely geared towards the protection of the safety of people at the same time as getting medications to them. But one of the problems we had back then is that when we were talking about the design of clinical trials and accessibility to clinical trials, we used paradigms and models that were geared to diseases that were not at all like HIV AIDS, in which at the time we had no therapy at all. And we were talking about clinical trials that had very, very rigid restriction entry uh, criteria and restrictive criteria for excluding individuals. And what we did was in good intentions until it, uh, the, the, the activists brought to our attention 
the fact that it just is not working for them. I mean, for example, when you had no therapies at all at the time when we had AZT, um, I remember very clearly what I think you were referring to was when I became a proponent of the parallel track approach where you don't want to interfere with the integrity of a clinical trial, but by excluding the only available uh, therapy for an individual uh, because they were geographically not in a place where the clinical trial was going, really didn't take into account the fact that they had no other options. You know, a typical example of that when we were testing gancyclovir for uh, cytomegalovirus retinitis in individuals who were going blind. And the criteria said that if you're on AZT, the fact is that you can't get gancyclovir, gancyclovir trial because we wanted to make sure we wouldn't mix up what the toxicities were. We wanted to just have gancyclovir. When, when you come to think of it, the only people who really needed gancyclovir at the time were the people who were living with HIV who needed AZT at the time. So we were telling them this amazing thing that just, I, I had a conversation with a person living with HIV that he brought me to tears and rage at the same time when he said, so in other words, Dr. Fauci, what you're telling me is that I have a choice. I could either have AZT without gancyclovir and go blind, or I can have gancyclovir without AZT and die. He said, are you absolutely crazy? Uh, and that's when I became so clear that we really had to have a situation where you could put people on a clinical trial, have the integrity of the clinical trial, but make an intervention available to other people as long as they were willing to take the risk and there was a reasonable chance they would benefit from that. That was just one example of, of you know, my awakening to the fact that you've got to adhere to the fundamental principles and tenets of science but at the same time, you've really got to keep an open mind and be flexible when you're dealing with real human beings. And what parallels, if any, do you find in the, in the way in which treatments are being evaluated for COVID-19? Well, you know, the thing that I would say less a parallel than a contrast right now, because one thing that we did learn in uh, the Ebola outbreak, of which our group played a major role, is that when you have an outbreak of a very serious disease, you definitely want to get as quickly as possible potential therapies to individuals, but you don't want to not engage in the clinical trial process because the standard classical way of doing um, the best for patients ultimately is to definitively prove that something is safe and effective. And the classic gold standard way of doing that is in a randomized placebo-controlled trial. And we showed during the, the Ebola outbreak that that, in fact, does work. Uh, and what we're seeing right now in COVID, that, in fact, that is the way you can prove. In fact, the two therapies that have been shown to be beneficial and safe in people with advanced disease is the remdesivir study, which we did in the United States and internationally, showing that remdesivir in patients with significant disease enough to cause hospitalization and requiring oxygen clearly diminished the time to recovery. And the UK did a great study on dexamethasone in which they showed in people who were either on ventilators or who were receiving oxygen that dexamethasone clearly had a major effect on the death rate, the 28-day mortality in these people. So we learned the importance of doing clinical trials in the context of an ongoing outbreak. So it was kind of like a continuity from one outbreak to another to another. One of the um, issues that has come up very potently in the pandemic have been the impact on black and ethnic minorities, people of color being more affected by COVID-19. I wonder how you think we can use this moment to address the racial disparities in health. Yeah, it is a very unfortunate situation that not only with COVID-19, but with other diseases, there has been disparity. We see that clearly in the United States with HIV. If you look at 
the population of African Americans is about 13 percent of the United States population and well over 40, 45 percent of all the new cases are among African Americans. You look at COVID, it, it, is, it is painful to see, but when you look at the minorities, African Americans, Latinx, and even Native Americans and Alaskan Americans and Pacific Islanders, take for example just the African Americans in our society. They get hit doubly by a disparity. One, the jobs that they, as a broad demographic group, it's always dangerous to generalize, but in this case, it's appropriate to generalize. When you look at that demographic group as a whole, the jobs they generally have put them on the front line of being out there interacting with people on the kinds of jobs that do not allow them to easily protect themselves from the close person-to-person -person contact that we know transmit the virus. So they have a greater chance to get infected to begin with. Then when you look at the statistics of what is the thing that determines if someone is going to develop a severity of a complication that would either put them in the hospital or even lead to their death. And you go through them and it's very clear that African Americans have a disparately larger percentage of the underlying conditions that lead to a serious outcome. Diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, um, obesity, all of the things that when you go down and look and you say, well, if that's the case, are you sure that that's the case? Well, you look at the numbers and look at the number of hospitalization per 100,000 and look at African Americans compared to whites or the general population, and it's multiples larger than that. So if there's anything that we can get out of this, is first of all, there's something that we can immediately do, is to focus and concentrate resources and accessibility to immediate diagnosis and care and contact tracing in areas that are demographically overrepresented by African Americans. But the thing that we can do that's probably more important is if ever there was a time when a disease shined a bright light on the disparities in health, which we're not going to fix in a week or a month or a year. It's the result of decades and decades of those social determinants of health that have allowed African Americans to be in a situation where they have a greater degree of diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, obesity. There are so many things that go into that. So if there's ever a silver lining, if you want to call it that, in this, it maybe it jolts us into realizing that we have to correct those disparities because otherwise the next situation that we have like this, we're going to see the same painful disparity that we're seeing now. Can I ask then also about long COVID? Um, it, it seems that, um, you know, that the original public health messaging was that vulnerable and elderly should be screened, it should be, um, you know, protected and, and cared for. Uh, but long COVID represents this um, sense that maybe younger people who, who get infection don't go to hospital, don't get very seriously ill, but then have this prolonged uh, multi-system illness. I wondered if, if now that these um, figures are emerging and people are affected with long COVID, does this change the public health messaging at all in your mind? mind? Well, it doesn't change my public health messaging because I have always said, although you realize that when you look at hospitalizations and deaths, there's a bar graph that shows, you know, the younger people, it's a little bit of a blip and then it goes up with from your 75 up through 85 plus hospital inundations and death are clearly more prevalent there. But the other thing that I've said is that, you know, we're learning week by week and month by month about this disease. And I don't think it's safe to say that because young people don't wind up in the hospital and die when they get infected, because most of them have minimum symptomatology that we need to pay attention to what the long range effects are because we're starting to see things that are what we call emerging information. There's no way to make any definitive statement, 
but clearly there are people who have been sick enough to stay home and maybe not even be in the hospital, who when they recover virologically, all of a sudden you look at how long it takes for them to get back to normal. And there are reports that say it takes weeks to a month. But then the more you look at it, there are some people who go for a significant period of time with myalgias, fatigue, what they refer to as brain fog, or just inability to, to concentrate. There's another thing that we're learning that we need to keep an eye out on, that there have been some studies, one from Germany and now a more recent one from the United States. When you look at the cardiovascular effects, even on people without symptoms, who've recovered virologically, and you do MRIs on them, on their hearts, and you see that there's a degree of inflammation that might even be asymptomatic. But you've got to ask yourself, an asymptomatic inflammatory process now, six months or a year from now, does that lead to arrhythmias, to cardiomyopathies? We don't know that. So that's the reason why I think we need to take this disease with a degree of humility that we don't know everything about it yet. So that's the reason why we've got to be really, really, uh, you know, committed to preventing infection and preventing disease. That's the reason why we talk about universal wearing of masks, avoiding crowds, distance, outdoor better than indoor, washing hands, and do everything we can to get a vaccine so that we can get this thing under control because it is not something to be taking in a trivial way at all. We already know that. Just look at the numbers. And sadly, the UK and the US share the ignominy, you could say the tragedy of being among the world's worst performing countries in the developed world in relation to COVID-19. And uh, the BMJ's UK readers will be all too familiar for the reasons for this in the UK. Um, but I just wondered if you could talk to us about why you think this is unfolding in the US. Bill Gates, in an interview with, the, with STAT, magazine said it's been mismanaged every step of the way um, with, with the huge numbers of cases and, and the ongoing numbers of deaths. Why do you think this has happened in the U.S.? Well, I, I can't give you any reason, and of course, because of, this, of the sensitivity of the subject, I'm not going to be pointing fingers or doing any blaming. So let me take an approach that I think is one of the factors that I don't think blames anyone, but is very clear for anybody who pays attention. You know, the United States is a very large country. It's heterogeneous in so many ways, demographically, geographically, um, but particularly in the level of infection that we have in different places. And one of the, uh, I think, very important and in some cases positive aspects of it is that it is the United States of America. It's a federalist society where you have one central federal government but an awful lot of responsibility can and is given to the states. So what we have, and again, this is just one of the reason, what we had was not a uniform approach, that enough flexibility was given to the states, that when we had things like the shutdown that we had, if you look at the degree to which we shut down compared to the European Union, and take a couple of countries that are representative of the European Union, when you look at visits to parks and, and public places, business, businesses, stores, et cetera, the curves are that the European Union went way down and then came up. We went partially down. And when you look at our curves, and this is the thing that's the, the most painful to me, if you look at the European Union curve, it goes up, they get hit badly, then they come down to a very low baseline. Now, right now, as they're trying to reopen the economy, unfortunately, we're seeing surges, such as you're seeing currently in Spain and other countries. But in the United States, when we went up to a peak, which was dominated mostly by more than 50% by the New York metropolitan area, where at one point in our outbreak, 50% of the cases, the deaths, the hospitalizations were in the New York metropolitan area. They ultimately got it under control and did very well. 
But the country, as a heterogeneous group of states, the country came down to an unacceptably high baseline. It was like 20,000 a day for a period of several weeks to months. Then when we decided to open up the economy to get the jobs back, that some states did it in a way that was not appropriate. Because we put very clear gateway, phase one, phase two, phase three. And as you well know, there were some states that decided to jump over and not go, like maybe from the gateway to stage two, and jumped over stage one, or disregarded it completely. Another thing that we had in our country, which again is part of the independent spirit that is so wonderful in America, sometimes works against you because some of the authorities of the states did it well. They said, okay, here's what we need to do. We need to go from gateway to phase one, and then from phase one where we succeed phase two. And yet when you looked at the film clips of people who were so-called in phase one or phase two, congregating at bars with no masks. So what then happened, particularly the surges after the 4th of July holiday and the Memorial Day holiday, you saw a surge go up so that we were averaging 60 to, at one point, 75,000 cases in a day. So now we're starting to go back down again when you look, but it's plateauing between, like I looked at yesterday's statistics, it was something like 35 to 43,000 new cases, and yesterday we had 1,000 deaths. You know, the day before it was like 500 or so. So, you know, even though we've done some things really well, and there are things, there are areas in the country that are doing quite well. I was just on a press conference with the governor of Vermont yesterday, his test positivity is 0.2%. In New York now, it's 1% or less. So there are regions that are doing really well. But when you put it all together and look at a country, there are always these blips that you have to continually put down. The most recent challenge is bringing the college kids back to campus and finding out that there are variable ways that we're handling that. So again, I don't want to go into all of the difficulties except to say we've done well in some respects, but it is patchy and not uniform well as a country. Can you see lessons for the UK and some of and, and then thinking about a vaccine, Dr. Fauci, I mean, clearly, clearly we all want a vaccine as soon as possible. Um, there is a worry, though, that, that, that is, you will no doubt have picked up the sense that it, it's being there's a rush on for the vaccine. Is that going to be the right thing for getting an effective and safe vaccine? And and the, the specific kind of political pressure to have a vaccine by November the third for the U.S. election. Um, what what do you feel about that? And in particular, who? Who has the authority to finally approve a vaccine in the States? Is it the FDA or, as seems to be the case, that the Health and Human Services um, could, could actually overrule the FDA? Um, what, what would happen under those circumstances? Well, I think what people need to understand, I mean, obviously, we're in a very divisive society, not only in the United States, but in so many places throughout the world, including the European Union and the UK. It's a lot of things are politicized, but I think the people of the world and the people in the United States should realize that there are a lot of fail-safe checks on things. So strictly speaking, in answer to your question, the regulatory authority being the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is the one that makes that decision. We have assurances from the commissioner of FDA that science itself and not political considerations will dictate the decisions about the regulatory components of the vaccine trial. The other thing that we have that I think you, the UK, I'm sure, has a version of this is that with every trial, there's a data and safety monitoring board. And the data and safety monitoring board looks at the data at predetermined time and analyzes not only safety issues, but also efficacy issues and will make a statement or a determination that this trial likely should stop because it's effective enough 
that it would almost be unethical to continue with the placebo. We've had that situation many times, and you make a declaration. Um, also, the FDA has an advisory board, the VERPAC, which is a board that they get advice to about making determinations about regulation. And also, there's a process called an emergency use authorization in which the FDA can actually get material, material being the intervention, the vaccine, out to the general public before you have the official approval and licensure. The official approval being a response to a biological uh, license application, a BLA. Um, so I think there are multiple checks there. You're asking a question, can in a political atmosphere, someone, Secretary of HHS or the president, come in and overrule what the FDA would say? You know, theoretically that's possible, but that would be so obvious to everyone that I think it would be difficult to do that. I don't think at all because, you know, the administration has said that they want to make decisions based on science. And the FDA commissioner has made that very clear and has actually written op-eds that that would be the case. So I, I have confidence in the FDA and I have confidence in their promise to make sure that political considerations don't enter into their decisions. Uh, and what about the, the CDC? I mean, the, the widespread reports of political interference from the White House and the latest um, uh, report that Michael Caputo, the spokesperson for the CDC, has a Facebook post accusing of accusing career government scientists of sedition. I, I gather he's just taken a leave of absence. I, I wonder what this says about the political environment within the agencies, and, and should we be worried about their scientific independence? No, they are. I mean, I, I can tell you one thing is absolutely certain, that the National Institutes of Health <laughs> is beyond any political influence. I will guarantee you that for absolutely certain. The CDC also, you know, the CDC is an extraordinary public health agency. And yes, you've seen in the media reports about trying to manipulate. But just remember one thing. The person that wrote those things about the CDC is doing this and that is out. OK, that person is gone. The person who was the assistant secretary. There were issues there that I don't want to get into is in a leave of absence. But there was one person who wasn't the assistant secretary. That was someone who was hired to help out, who made the statements about the CDC to try and influence the CDC. That person is no longer with the department. So I think that speaks to the answer to your question. And, and what would you say have been the main points of difference between you and President Trump? Um, I, I guess the, the underlying question is what aspects, in what aspects has the administration failed to respond to the science in, in a way that you would have liked? No, I, I don't think it's failed to respond to the science. The only, I mean, I, am, I, am the, I feel the, to be privileged to be on the coronavirus task force. I have always spoken based on pure evidence and science. And that has been the case all along. Um, you know, there's always a lot of things in the press about a frayed relationship between the president and I, and that's, that's just not the case. I mean, a lot of times in the press it appears that way, but that really isn't the case. Um, I, I, I've been reading about the widespread support you have from clin clinicians and researchers, but also among the public. And I gather you can buy socks saying, I love Dr. Fauci on them. And um, the ultimate accolade, Dr. Fauci, you have a bobblehead doll. Uh, I gather, launched today perhaps, or just the, the, the day of this interview. Um, one of my colleagues says she doesn't have heroes, but that you're pretty close because you don't um, just throw stones from outside, but you've continued to speak truth to power from inside. How hard has that sometimes been? You know, it, it, it sometimes is, is, is difficult. It's not difficult to do if you just do it. Uh, some, you know, you just do it. You, you tell things the way they are. Sometimes that's in, not in agreement um, with what people would like to hear, but I learned a long time ago that people will ultimately have sustained respect for you if you give them the information based on science and not afraid to tell people things they do not want to hear. Whether they act on the things you tell them, that's beyond my power. The only thing that I can do is analyze the situation look at the scientific data, 
and make whatever recommendation they ask me to make, but you can be assured that it will be always based on scientific evidence and data. I gather you continue to see patients. I, I wonder how that's possible and why is that important to you? I think people may be surprised to hear you continue to see patients given everything else you're doing. Well, I, I do. And the reason I do is that, you know, I, I, I wear a number of hats. Uh, as you know, I'm uh, as a researcher, as someone who runs a large institute, uh, the policy issues I'm in right now. But if you ask me what my underlying identity is that always grounds me in the reality of what we need to do and gives me insight into the kind of emphasis we need is my, my identity as a physician. So if I were to pick one thing that was me, that was Tony Fauci, it was a physician. I'm a scientist to be sure, but I'm a scientist because I'm a physician scientist. I'm not a scientist in a vacuum. I'm a scientist that's a physician scientist. And it really helps me to understand uh, disease, understand pathogenesis where you get to see people, but also to understand the impact it has on them. And it inspires me. I think it gives me energy to know what it is that I'm dealing with firsthand. The way I did with Ebola, the way we're doing now with the diseases, and certainly what I did for a very long time with HIV. I think my understanding of HIV the questions that need to be answered is very much rooted in my intensive clinical experience that I had in persons living with HIV from the very beginning, from the 1980s. Dr. Fauci, a final question then. How will the pandemic end? You know, I believe it will end with uh, an effective and safe vaccine that ultimately will be widely distributed throughout the world. Um, but that is going to happen together with public health measures. I don't think it's going to be like measles, where it's 98% effective, even though it's a highly transmissible virus, you can essentially eliminate it in certain countries uh, the way we have successfully done, except when the anti-vaxxers don't want to get their kids vaccinated. I think if we get a reasonably good vaccine and have widespread coverage, and we do that so that gradually we get it down to essentially no disease at all. But you're not going to do it only with a vaccine. You got to do it with a vaccine together with public health measures until the overall protection, umbrella of protection, essentially is all over the world. That's not going to happen in a few months. It's probably going to take a year or two to happen. Dr. Fauci, thank you very much indeed for talking to us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be with you.